Uh, thank you everyone for tuning in to our panel, um, our Q&A. It's going to be a great one today. We have Senator Whitehouse, Reverend Yearwood, Julia Olson, and Christy Cooper. Um, let me provide some <laughs> brief context to what we're going to be talking about here. Uh, so I'm Vic Barrett. I'm a plaintiff on Juliana versus the United States uh, with 20 other young people suing the US federal government for the direct action it's taken to perpetuate the climate crisis. Um, I got started doing this work at 15 years old, 14 maybe, um, and found a lot of frustration with the process through the legislature in New York City where I was growing up. Um, and through that frustration got thrust into a pretty awesome journey with a lot of dope young people and cool adults too, of holding my government accountable um, for the uh, harm that is done to the climate. And Christy has been part of that journey for a long time, filming it um, as we go along. So I'll give everybody a chance to introduce themselves briefly around Robin style, um, maybe starting with Christy. Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm, I'm Christy Cooper. I'm the director and one of the producers of Youth VGov, um, the feature documentary that Vic Bear just hinted at. I'm so glad that you all could join us today, and we're really excited about this panel. Julia? Hi, Vic. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Julia Olson. I'm the executive director and chief legal counsel for Our Children's Trust, and we represent Vic and his co-plaintiffs in the Juliana case, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Rev? Hey, everybody, this is Rev here with president of the Hip Hop Caucus, uh, environmental activist, and just a huge fan of the documentary. So I'm just, I just found this, this panel to sit on with the, with the group to be here with them. So I can just keep talking about this great documentary. <laughs> and then last but not least, Senator Whitehouse. I'm uh, Sheldon Whitehouse and I'm a big fan of the lawsuit. Um, <laughs> watching from the Senate when we were all bollocked up behind the fossil fuel industry's politics. The uh, lawsuit really looked like a, a lantern in the darkness. And I'm really proud of everybody who's participated in it. The plaintiffs, the lawyers, the supporting cast, everyone. It's been impressive. Um, so let's just hop straight into the questions. Let's just talk about it. Um, so already, I think it's being clear that this isn't a regular um, climate action is not a regular thing to do. And I want Chrissy to start with, could you share with us how this story is different from a lot of other climate change films you may have seen or um, worked on before? Sure. Um, I think one thing that makes this, this story really unique is um, not only that it's being told from the perspective of these young people who are being disproportionately impacted by climate change, but this is also a story about our government and about our government's role in creating this climate crisis. And it's about our third branch of government and the importance of our judicial system in solving this problem. Um, so I think it's, you know, it's a really interesting um, uh, kind of way to come into this story of not talking typically about the, the impacts and the science. Those are definitely, you know, um, the basis of this case. But, but this is really about the youth speaking up and holding their government accountable to protect their future. No, I mean, as one of the youth, I totally would agree with that take of, um, it's a really unique story and a unique way of looking at government accountability and what government's duty is to young people um, or to the public in general, you know, when it doesn't come to just exchanging a vote on the bottom line, but talking about like, you know, what do you need to do to protect us and so that we can be the best country or generation for this country that we can be. Um, and I think young people have a really interesting take on that. Uh, Rev, I'd love to hear what, <laughs> Kat is joining us again. <laughs> I'd love to hear what you thought about the film and what elements resonated with you in terms of the climate justice work you've been involved in. I think the film is, as we all saw, is, is wonderful. But for me, my work has been pretty focused on demonstration, um, really working in the streets uh, to try to create change. And hopefully that demonstration would, would lead to legislation. And so a lot of times I'm usually connected to demonstration 
in legislation, but this film shows the importance of litigation. And I think that we now find out that demonstration without legislation or litigation leads to frustration. And so with this film, it really is a film that really brings to bear how long and arduous is the litigation process. I think that sometimes we think we can just go into the courts and make and have our, our case heard, but it shows that like for you, Vic, watching you grow up, like literally you were you you were so young back then and watching you now turn to be this a wonderful person is, is amazing. But I also think that on the, the real side of this, um, when I saw and heard about the 11 year old child who froze to death in Texas, or I'm hearing about the children who are literally without power and have energy poverty, then this case is about them and for their future. And it grieves me that children are dying in the greatest country in the world and the climate crisis is real and we're not making the change. Most definitely. It's been really stark seeing everything that's been happening in Texas and other parts around the country. Like, I don't know. It just seems like it's always reaffirmed. And it's not this new idea anymore that climate change manifests in so many ways and impacts people on the bottom line in so many ways. It seems like almost everyone is realizing now, except like the people who have the power to do something about it and in the in a lot of ways. Um, but you know, not true for everyone, right, Senator White House. Uh, let's talk about government accountability. Actually, is the next part we're going to get to, and uh, to a question I had for you, um, kind of in the scope of what we've been talking about. Um, could you talk a little bit? This is, this is a huge part of the case um, and a huge part of the movie. But could you talk a little bit about the historic partnership between? the government and fossil fuel industry in some ways and how the government, how some of the actions that certain parts of the government have taken have been in the interests of industries at times rather than maybe um, my, me and my co-plaintiffs or any fellow citizens of the United States. Yeah. Um, yeah. There are um, so many ways in which government is part of this case. And um, as you mentioned, there's a long history of the government at the fossil fuel industry's behest, having supported and promoted fossil fuel. So that's a very big uh, piece of it. Um, you also have the question about the sort of time travel question about will a government today hear from children who will be adults in the future about what they know is gonna happen to them? And can you have that time travel element work in government? Can we be accountable today to kids who are gonna suffer uh, in the future. Uh, then you've got the whole problem of what the fossil fuel industry did to block our efforts to fix this. And that's why it makes it so important that we're in court because until this election, the idea that you're gonna get by Mitch McConnell and Donald Trump with a legislative fix was a ridiculous idea. And it was to Rev's phrase, <laughs> frustration. Man, was there frustration. So now we've got a shot, but let's say we didn't. That means that the judicial branch of government becomes the last best hope for people to do the right thing. And it's also the place, unlike my business, Congress, where you have to tell the truth. People come in with their talking points and lie to us all day long, every day. It's what they do. You go to court and you do the same stuff and you can end up in serious trouble. So courts have a really important role in that question of how courts fit in government is part of this as well. So as somebody who looks and cares about government, this is a really interesting case. And I think it's um, one that needs to be decided and decided well. Yeah, I, I, mean, I really love the way that you answered that. And I, I remember when I was younger, a lot of the reason I would talk about being so invested in the case too was kind of that context of like, I feel like I've been putting all this information in front of my legislators and they could kind of just look at it and be like, okay, that's great. Whereas in court, you know, it's it's something that has to be answered to and has to be answered to um, with truth. I'm actually gonna follow, ask you a follow-up question just like out of um, curiosity. <laughs> my cat's curious too, clearly. <laughs> um, which is kind of, to somebody, you know, who isn't suing the government maybe or someone who just wants to support our case um, with the systems that we do have in, in place or, you know, like you're saying, sometimes it can be a little frustrating. What would you like tell maybe an average constituent who hears about this case isn't interested, it's like, and is interested in how they can kind of encourage government accountability in their local communities, um, sort of the best ways to do that from your perspective as a, as a politician? 
I would say, uh, you know, young people have every right to talk it up. Young people, particularly real children, little children are often told, use your inside voices. So this is a chance to use your outside voices and write letters to the editor of your paper and uh, follow Rev Yearwood out there demonstrating and uh, make sure you're in touch with your legislators to let them know how you feel. It may not feel like it makes a difference, but it does pile up and um, ultimately it will make a difference. So, so be involved and recognize this is a big deal. I mean, if you look at lawsuits, basically the tobacco litigation that shut down a similar pattern of lies from the tobacco industry and Brown versus Board of Education, which shut down a disgraceful, divided, uh, racist way of delivering education to kids. Those, that's kind of the scale that we're working at. So don't expect it to come easy, but don't stop just because it's hard. I definitely love that response. Um, and especially the touching on young people can, a lot of times they do, a lot of people do tell young people to sit down and be quiet in a lot of ways. Um, that definitely in my experience when I was younger doing work like in local government with city council members and stuff. Um, Rev, I wanted to ask kind of, as somebody who's been doing climate work um, for a good amount of time, do, like you said, doing demonstrations, being out in the streets, what, what, what do you think is unique about how our generation is and is interacting with climate change is an, and is impacted by it? Um, and also how we're addressing it and the solutions that we're bringing to the table. Well, I think that it's clear that your generation, um, now they say Gen Z and not even Gen Z, Gen C, which is, I said, Generation COVID, which is um, a daunting situation that you're dealing with a generation that are being come up in crises, right? And so I think that the difference between your generation those of us who are a little older, the, the late millennials and the Gen Xs and even the boomers, is that our parents primarily fought for equality. Um, but the difference here, Vic, is that you're not only fighting for equality, but you're fighting for existence. And that's a hard thing. You know, my hat is 90 years, which is in regards to the IPCC report, given to a panel on climate change. And thank goodness that we're back in the Paris Climate Accord but it's a reality that we're dealing with that. So I think that your generation has a sense of urgency, doesn't want to deal with any kind of this malarkey. Uh, a, a malarkey. Um, I think the solutions there are, are what you're doing now. I think that what we're seeing as far as young people demonstrating, uh, literally out there from the Bahia pipeline to line three to the MVP pipeline um, to out there in the streets, but also I think that this case, this case is critical because what I've seen, remember I was talking with Juliana about this and we were talking about how this case is also getting other people around the world to sue their governments. And that's one of the most amazing things about this. Um, so they're watching this and they're getting like a kind of a, a case law, so to speak, a, a roadmap to about, about seeing another pattern. So you're seeing other, other young people around the globe suing just for their right to live. And so I think that that's a, a major solution in that regard. Yeah, I, I like the way you framed that too, because it is this really like stark reality of, you, of young people in a lot of ways are fighting for this right to existence, but because of that stark reality, there's like a lot of great pushback and inspiration to like actually stand up and do something in us. And I think that, I, I think that's important. I like the way you framed up. Julia, <laughs> you're up next. Um, we're talking case updates and latest news and getting into the, the um, what's going on basically. So we just filed a new motion in the district court in front of Judge Aiken. Um, and so, yeah, just give us the lowdown. What does that mean for the case and what does it mean regarding the Supreme Court. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so I think, you know, everyone sees in the film, there's a little bit of a cliffhanger where the, the Ninth Circuit has said that, that you, Vic, and your, your co-plaintiffs don't have standing because uh, the court, two of the judges on the three judge panel said, well, we can't, 
we can't give you the plan you want. You asked for this big remedial plan that the government put in place and the court doesn't have authority to do that. And so in response to that, where we're at is we, we have three paths ahead of us. This case is not nearly over. Uh, the first is we're back in the district court and we're asking Judge Aiken to grant leave to amend and we've taken out that one request for a remedial plan that the, the Court of Appeals thought was problematic. And we've asked for some other things that are well within a court's authority, like number one, do what the court did in Brown versus Board of Education and declare the energy system of the United States unconstitutional. Make that declaration of law that's really important that will guide government activities going forward. Uh, so if Judge Aiken takes that up, then we'll be back on, on track for trial. The other thing we're doing is we've asked the Biden-Harris administration and the defendants to come to the settlement table with you all and, and see if there's a way to engage in settlement and, and get a court order that the parties agree to going forward. And then the third path, if the district court doesn't take up your amended complaint, then we can petition the US Supreme Court for review of the Court of Appeals decision. And, and we actually think the Court of Appeals really got it wrong on the law. So we're, we're preserving that opportunity, um, but hopefully we'll be instead on a, on a settlement or trial track going forward. And we're, we're excited. And if I could jump in on point two, back when the tobacco litigation was going on, that started in the private sector but the Department of Justice joined in and actually got an injunction against the tobacco industry ordering them to stop lying about their products. And the, the victory by the Department of Justice was a, was a big deal. So there's precedent for the government getting involved, for the Biden administration to get involved. Yeah, um, it's actually perfect that you jumped in um, because my next question was for you actually as a as a trial attorney, I was actually really interested to hear what you think about, you know, the plan that Julia just laid out and our, ch our uh, chances with this new motion to amend our complaint um, and kind of like the commonality of this in cases and what it looks like uh, historically. Well, we filed a brief in the Baltimore case, which is the one, an amicus brief, a friend of the court brief, which is the one before the Supreme Court right now, and that I think will have some effect depending on what the Supreme Court says. In many respects, this is gonna be a test of the Supreme Court um, and to see whether they're willing to um, render a fair decision in a case like this. Um, so there's a lot to watch and that will help uh, Julia frame her case going forward as well. But yeah. motions to amend are really common, right, Senator Whitehouse? Like it's Very what you common. do when you get dismissed. Particularly after a partially successful appeal, when you come back and have to amend to uh, implement the appellate court's decision. So that's very standard. The other thing that's notable about Julia's case is how impressive some of the witness testimony is. You've got a Nobel Prize winning economist, Joseph Stiglitz, laying out the case for the economic harm in a really telling, really clear way. And he's willing to put himself out under oath, subject to cross-examination. It's um, a really powerful statement. It's one I use a lot. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, Julia is pretty fantastic. <laughs> um, I actually wanted to ask you a question, Christy, um, in regards to sort of, in while making the film, while making the movie in regards to sort of following um, the lawyers particularly and the, the legal, um, some of the more <laughs> like complicated legal parts that you broke down really well in the film. Um, and I'm sure you probably learned a lot about law along the way too, kind of just talking about that experience of it would be interesting, I feel like. Yeah, I mean, it's been, it's been now a 10 year journey of, um, you know, working, working with storytelling around climate litigation. My, I, my first um, experience with this was back in 2011 when Julia and our Children's Trust filed the legal actions in every state around the country as well as the first federal case. And 
<clears throat> we did these 10 short stories called uh, stories of trust about some of the state plaintiffs. And so that was like a big dive for me coming from a science background and then a film a film background of like having to dive deep into the whole legal, the legal framework and understanding um, just even for me to have enough understanding to know how to tell these stories. Um, and when you guys, you know, filed this case in 2015, I was kind of watching with bated breath to see what was going to happen and was really excited in the following spring when Judge Coffin ruled in your favor. And that was when I approached Julia and asked if she would give me exclusive access to follow this. And it's been, you know, it's been a journey. It's been a challenge following a case where you have no control over where it's going from a time stamp, from a time frame, scheduling decisions, you know, like knowing how, how, where, where any of this is going to go. And so it's been a lot of, um, you know, just, I think a lot of documentary filmmakers um, experience that when they're following real stories that are unfolding. But one of the, um, I think, really kind of fun things was when we finally sat down with our over 200 hours of footage and started to put the story together and figure out how we wanted to tell it. And we had like these really compelling stories of, of you know, you your youth stories and what you were experiencing in the harms at home, as well as the, you know, the courtroom drama and the legal framing. And then of course, all of this historical background of digging into archival materials all the way back to the fifties and sixties and trying to figure out a way to, to put, to weave this whole story together. And the concept that we came up with for our kind of our story arc was actually to use the, um, um, the, the framework around standing and what it means to have standing in a lawsuit. And so throughout the story, we, you know, we broke this down into first, the first stand, the first, um, like blinking on the word. Um, Injury in fact. The, well, no, the, like the first element, element, that was what I was looking for. The first element of standing is to prove that you're injured. And so that's kind of the, you know, the first, the first uh, act of the story was about the injury. And then the second part, the second element of standing is to prove that the defendants caused the harm. And that's kind of the second part that we go through into this, into this historical background. And then the third part of standing is proving that the courts can actually provide a remedy to that harm. And that's where we dig into the, the Ninth Circuit Court decision and we talk about declaratory relief um, and what that would mean for this case. And so it was, it, was a, um, it was quite a storytelling journey for us to figure out how to use the backbone of standing as kind of like our story arc through the film. And we, you know, we hope that people also will learn a little bit about the legal system through this film and not just about this case in, in particular. I love it, Christy. Um, it's really interesting to hear sort of, because uh, I always, I mean, I could go on forever about how it's incredible to me to even put together like a documentary and a story, especially of something like this, because even when watching it, I'm kind of just like, oh, that's my life. And I lived it. And like Christy did a really good job also of like putting it into like a 90 minute <laughs> film. And um, even though it was however many years, um, for me and my other co-plaintiffs. Um, but I actually have one more question left and I think it's perfectly timed um, considering Senator Whitehouse gets to go and make history. <laughs> uh, so they, just, they just ping me that the floor is 10 minutes slow. So I'm in oh, okay. shape. Okay, okay, awesome, great. <laughs> um, but a question that I had um, was, I'm wondering kind of, we the plaintiffs in the in this case basically are asking to provide declaratory relief. Um, so I'm wondering if we could talk a bit about the importance of this, um, as well as the historical significance that this kind of remedy provided in other constitutional cases, sort of as Brown versus Board of Education. Yeah, um, and we could start with you, Senator Whitehouse. Well, the first piece, of course, is is understanding that there's a constitutional harm that has been committed. And that was the basis of Brown versus Board of Education that in fact, when black children were set aside in segregated schools, that was a harm and you had to win that point. And then you could move on to finding what declaratory remedies should be applied 
And here, settling the question that your future self being harmed by something that can only be prevented now affects your constitutional property and life interests is the, the, the fundamental question here that needs to be settled. And I hope and expect it will be settled uh, the right way. And then there are all sorts of ways to get the declaratory relief, but I think any way that you can win a, a remedy uh, advances the cause. You know, in the tobacco case, there was no, um, there was nothing about smoking, nothing about the tobacco industry in the Department of Justice tobacco case that they won except this. The judge, Judge Kessler, she found that the industry had lied. She found that they had lied. She wrote a 1600 page decision chronicling the history of lying that they had gone. And she said, no more, you're gonna have to stop the lying. And that took the gas out from under the political lying and muscle machine that had propped them up in Congress. And one thing led to another, it was kind of a cascade effect. So it's really important to remember that big victories can come from small ones as long as that small victory is you know, strategic. And so declaratory relief can be a small thing that turns into a very big thing. Julia? Yeah, I think one thing that declaratory relief does in a constitutional case is it tells government what it can and can't do anymore when it comes to people's rights. And so, I mean, the, the beautiful thing that Brown versus Board did was say that Plessy versus Ferguson, separate but equal, was unconstitutional. And that transformed who we are as a nation. Um, it's, it's not a perfect fix for racism, of course, but it was a really vital step. And the same, is, the same has been true with sex discrimination and the work that, that Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg did. Those were constitutional declarations of rights. And, and what's so important with that on climate and the way we operate our energy system is we can't have the political whims of one administration to the next decide this question that is about your life and your liberty. Vic, this is, this is too important to be put to a vote. And that's the thing about our constitutional rights. They don't get to be put to a vote. That we're, our rights are supposed to be protected. And the court is the only branch of our three branches of government that can render that judgment. None of the other branches can do that. They're not authorized under the constitution. Yeah. It's also mm -hmm. the only one that polices itself against lying. Yep. Uh, Reverend Yearwood, do you have do you have any um, thoughts on sort of this case in uh, as well as sort of the historical significance of this kind of case, like keeping in mind cases like Brown versus Board of Education? Well, I actually have a I have a question for our, our attorneys here on the panel as well. I think that my question, based upon what Senator Wiles was saying, is how how does the, the the other cases will impact this one? I know the attorney generals across the country are suing. I know the fossil fuel companies um, and getting and getting that discovery as well, which you were so good at doing in, in this process in amazing fashion through, through this documentary. We saw that. But I guess how would that impact now? We're now seeing these brave attorney generals across the country suing. How will that how will that impact this case? Well, the discovery can make a very big difference. It was the discovery in the tobacco case that showed that the tobacco industry executives were lying when they stood in Congress and said they didn't have any information about how um, their product was uh, both dangerous and addictive. And um, you know, little by little, as their internal memos came out, they just became completely toxic and incredible. And that changed the whole political dynamic around it. The other thing that's important about these cases is that in Baltimore and in other cases, the uh, fossil fuel industry has basically said, hey, these cases are too big for courtrooms. These are too big to sue cases. And those big cases in the past, like tobacco and Brown versus Board of Education show that there's no size limit on what a court can decide as long as the constitutional rights are involved. And um, so they stand as a good precedent against that too big to sue uh, argument that the fossil fuel industry has made. Yeah, and Revere, with the important difference between them and 
and the different importance of both of these cases is that the case that, that Vic is involved in, Juliana, it's holding government accountable because government has done wrong and it's protecting rights. And the cases against the industry, the fossil fuel industry, um, they're trying to recover damages, money damages in part, um, and change the practices of the industry that has profited off of, of this conduct. And so both cases, both types of cases are really important because there has been a real partnership between government and industry as Senator Whitehouse talked about. And I would just add, Vic, to your, your second part to that significance. Um, took it for you and me and definitely for, um, even for, and definitely for women's rights and for everyone's rights, human rights, period. But for me as a person of color, um, the Dred Scott case, Plessy, B. Ferguson, Brown v. Board of Education, I wouldn't be on this panel right now if it wasn't for those cases. Uh, I wouldn't be on, these, on this panel right now. And so it, it's daunting when I think about that and how much pain went into those cases, but I am, I, I, I am a recipient of that. And so now when I think about this case, literally 100 years or 20 years from now, I thought about them even being on a on a Zoom call, whatever they may have back then. I don't know what they may have what they had then, <laughs> but it's literally if they can have clean air or clean water, and so it's literally about them living or dying. And so the significance of this case is is something that I know that when we all are gone, hopefully they will even see these recordings of humanity still fighting for existence. Unfortunately, if if we if we if we if we allow for us to continue on that path we're on now. You know, 200 years from now, these 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 would be the only thing on this planet would be these tapes that no one will see. Yeah, and I, that's perfect segue to sort of what I was going to say to wrap up the conversation um, and let Senator Whitehouse get off. Um, I was going to sort of wrap. I just it's interesting to talk about it in this context of like these past cases and where we're at now, because it leaves this thought in my head of like, kind of exactly like you said, Rev of like in 20, 40, 50, and 200 years, you know, what are gonna be just like us being on this call right now is a manifestation of the work that was done for Brown versus Board of Education or Plessy versus Ferguson. Um, what'll be the manifestations of this lawsuit? Will it look like, I don't know, like a high speed rail across the United States or will it just look like people having conversations about it? it, it what will the legacy of it be? Um, and there's just, and to me, it's like no question at this point that it'll mean something, you know, and that's what's important. Um, and, you know, I, I'm glad we could have this conversation. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, I know that I really did getting to just ask you guys questions. A lot of the times I'm on the panel, so I don't get to just, <laughs> you know, <laughs> poke at people and see what's up in their minds. So, um, yeah, uh, this is really great. And thank you all. I just have wanted to say I, how much I appreciate this panel and that it really represents the, all of the work that goes in um, from all of the different elements. I mean, you know, we're talking about the, you know, eliminating frustration and, you know, Reverend Yearwood, the work that you do, the demonstration work and the frontline work on the streets and, and how important it is, Vic, to have the young voices have a seat at the table and be part of this discussion and part of the solutions. And Julia, the important work that you do in the courtroom and, and helping to protect our rights and Senator Whitehouse, the, the amazing work that you do in representing us and, and fighting um, to protect those laws that need to protect us and um, going to bat every day um, on behalf of us. Um, it's so appreciative, well, appreciated I'm and- to Shout out to Julia, because there's nothing better for a lawyer than to take an old doctrine and find new ways to apply it to a big problem. And that's what this case is. So I'm just Absolutely. a good lawyer, thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And, and Christy, we couldn't do it without storytellers. So for all of your energy, I mean, we're here because of the film and truly what we do wouldn't mean anything if we couldn't tell the story about it and, and let people know. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.